Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Apostle Clark Abood and welcome to our second service um, that we've had here in Orem, Utah. Today I want to talk about the fascination of men versus the love for God. Now, this is going to be part of our honoring your agency or self-stewardship um, series that I want to be able to have because I've noticed that there is a need for that here. So why did God give free agency? Why did he give us a free will? I believe there's many, there's many reasons, but one of the primary reasons that I want to talk to you guys about tonight is so that we are tested to see whether we truly love God or whether we are going to give in to the fascinations of men and follow men and let them guide our agency and try and take shortcuts. So I want to talk about some of the shortcuts that I've taken in my life as a Christian and the horrible things that came about because of that. Now, when I first became a Christian, I honestly let my pastor and other people that I listened to really tell me what the Bible had to say. And I read a little bit of it and I didn't make much sense of it because honestly, you know, the teachings I received, they didn't go in line with the Bible. It wasn't rightly dividing the word. And I let um, what other people said really direct my path. And so when I wanted to take God more seriously, I listened to a lot of sermons, hours and hours of sermons every, every day. I listened to, let's say, six or eight hours of sermons. And I felt like if I did that, I would really get to know the Bible quickly and efficiently. And as the years went on, I realized that I had spent a lot of time listening to some false doctrines. And so I would have to go back and read through the scriptures myself. And I realized it took a lot more time correcting mistakes than it would have if I would have just read the Bible myself. So I want to talk about the first point, trusting only Jesus and no man. Now, if you'd like to turn to John chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, and we're going to see Jesus' uh, thoughts on trusting men. All right. But Jesus did not commit himself unto men, unto them, because he knew all men, and he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So Jesus here knows what's inside of man. He knows that he cannot trust man. And it's true for every single man. They're going to fall short, and our trust needs to be in God. Let me go ahead and read a couple more verses. You don't have to follow along if you don't want to. In Psalms 118, verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In Jeremiah chapter 17, 5 to 7, Thus saith the Lord, saith the Lord Cursed be the man that trusteth, trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trust, trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. So we see the need to trust in the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, and not in man. And there is this temptation out there to take shortcuts. And honestly, we take shortcuts because we're fascinated by other men. We see something better in them than ourselves, and we trust in their agency, in their free will, and how they are being, uh, how they're reading the Bible, and how they're living their life. And we need to be following God and not going after this lust in our heart of being fascinated by men. 
So let's read Matthew 23, verse 10. Go ahead and turn to it. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. In the King James, the word master being used there is the word guide. No man is to be your guide. Jesus Christ alone is to be your guide. So even Moses wasn't a guide to Israel. Let's read about that. Let me go ahead and, and read that for you guys in Matthew chapter 15. Go ahead and uh, take your time to turn to those verses. Exodus chapter 15, verses 1, and we're also going to read verse 13. Starting from verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he hath trumpeted gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So we see in Exodus 15, Moses is singing a song with Israel. And in verse 13, we read, Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou has redeemed. Thou has guided them in thy strength unto the holy habitation. Was it Moses guiding Israel? Ultimately, it was God himself. Even the Apostle Paul wasn't a guide. In Acts 17, verse 11, I'll let you guys turn to that. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You see, in Acts 17, when those in... Um, those who Paul was speaking to, they were good Bereans. They went and looked into what Paul was saying, whether they were true. Paul didn't go and accuse them of not being as faithful for not taking his word for it. Paul didn't say, oh, you're prideful or you're being selfish and that's why you're not accepting it right off the, right off the top. We ought to be testing every little thing. To, seeing whether, to see whether it's from God. So God is our guide. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teacheth you. But as the same anointing teaching you all things and is truth, it is no lie, and even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. So we see the Holy Spirit as our, our teacher, and ultimately he is our teacher, and we need to be going to him, we need to be going to God as we use our agency, as our free will, to finding out whether things are true or not. All right, if you see my uh, son walking around, uh, you know, this is a house church. We don't do any kind of Sunday school or anything like that. Families are to be together and children are to learn from their parents and be around them. There is no commandment of uh, some kind of Sunday school teacher or youth pastor teaching children. It's the duty of the parents and we welcome the children. They may not be listening to parts, but ultimately they are seeing their parents and how in the model, role, the role model their parents are being and seeing they need to be like their parents. So you see the little kids running around, just understand 
Um, that's how we're doing it here. Those who, uh, all right, so those who make men their guide, uh, turn to Second Timothy chapter 4. Verses 3 to 4. Alright. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. So as I was going through this passage, the word enduring, it can also be put it could also be said, put up with. So there's a lot of people who don't want to put up with listening and really spending the time that they really need to invest in their relationship with God. And this longing, it can also, or this lust, it can also be interpreted as longings. So these people here, for the time will come when they will not put up with sound doctrine. But after their own longings, they shall heap to themselves teachers. So ultimately, these, when we want to take shortcuts, when we don't want to have to put in the time that it takes to really be, um, to walk faithfully with God, we're doing it because of our lust. We're doing it because we, we want to take that time, I'm sure, to go do something else, have fun, get distracted with the things of this world. And that shouldn't be what we were doing. So those who, um, so those who make men their guide can also be doing so because they're bewitched. Turn to Galatians chapter three, verse one. So in Galatians, Paul is talking to believers who allowed for Judaizers to come among them to teach them to do circumcision. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. So this is what Paul says to them. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been um, evidently set forth, crucif crucified among you. So in Galatians 3, 1, we see Paul saying, who bewitched you? And this word bewitched can really be translated as fascinated, deceitfully. So we see that it's not just when we want to heap teachers to ourselves that people be, are led away trying to take shortcuts, but it's also when we're fascinated by others who we think are more knowledgeable than us, who when we don't have, we don't think soberly about ourselves and we have so much self-doubt that we let other people make decisions for us. And even in that, we could say, oh, you know, I studied it, I prayed about it, and I'm not following blindly. But, the case, but this is what I want to ask you guys. You may say you're not following blindly, but are you really taking in the work? Are you really spending the time that you really need in the scriptures to know whether you're, what you're hearing is true? And are you really fascinated with these men or women? Are you trusting them more than you're trusting yourselves? Are you trusting in man rather than the Lord? So let me go ahead and go to, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 4 and 5. Okay. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the, of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should, not, faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we see from Paul's example, he didn't go out enticing or let's just say uh, fascinating men, beguiling them. He was speaking to them clearly and not of man's wisdom. It was of the Holy Spirit that he was speaking. 
the Holy Spirit, the one who we should trust. So let's talk about why God allows for confusion, why God allows for all this, uh, all these denominations. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 and 19. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise ye not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you, that which are approved, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. So God allows for the confusion. He allows for these divisions. And it's a way of us really testing ourselves and testing the love that we have for God. Because if we had everything spoon-fed to us, if we had everything laid out, we would just say, okay, I, already, I can just look this up. I don't really need to read the scriptures. I don't really need to um, te- you know, say this person is a false teacher because of this, 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 and this. You know, false teachers are around so that we are able to really strengthen ourselves in the Word. That we're not no longer babes with the milk, but we become um, eaters of the meat. So let's go ahead and read uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. You'll see this point made by Paul. Or let's just say the author of Hebrews, because there's a lot of speculation about that. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. God gives free will that we become strong, that we, um, let's see, that we exercise, we learn how to exercise our senses. Do you have a question? What verse was that? Um, Hebrews chapter 5, 13 to 14. Okay. Sorry. Right. So let's go to um, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And we'll see more of this development that these challenges that we face from various different doctrines and various denominations does to us. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So we see this trying of your faith in these diverse temptations. There's countless temptations to believe this doctrine or that doctrine. And all this is for our good. These challenges that we face are all for our good. It makes us take God and his word and sound doctrine a lot more seriously. Let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Verses 1 to 3. Okay. So this is speaking about false prophets as a way to discern them and it also gives us insight of what God thinks about all of this. If there arise, arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or a wonder cometh comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord 
your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So why does it say that God allows for these false prophets, even those whose um, prop, proclamations and sayings come to pass? It is for him to know whether we love God or we don't. Our agency is vital and important. And God expects us to not be lazy. He expects us to be good Bereans. And if, we really, if we're really loving God, if we're seeking God with all our heart, He is going to be seeking after us. And the truth is, if you are following some man, if you're making some prophet or apostle or bishop or reverend, your guide you're going to be you're going to stop seeking after God because you're going to already say I already have all the answers I already know all the answers I have it all this guy gets everything I'm fascinated by him he clearly speaks to God I can't communicate to God like he can let us seek God so let's talk about Let's see. So ultimately, when we try and take shortcuts, it demonstrates our lack of love for God. And it shows that we are longing and we have a fascination for men. And we see this in Genesis chapter 3. When Satan is talking to Eve, he says, Did God really say, Surely you won't die? And when Eve questions her, what she has heard, when she questions her sanity, she sees the fruit. She sees it with her longing. She is fascinated by that fruit, and it makes her sin. You see, Satan, one of the biggest things that he does is he makes us question what God has said. He makes us question our sanity. He makes us question our hope. And he makes us push down our agency, our free will, and put it in the hands of someone else. And this idea of questioning your sanity, it is what First Corinthians talks about as the spirit of confusion. And God doesn't give us the spirit of confusion. He doesn't confuse us to give in to his will. Satan does. What Satan does is he confuses us. He distorts our reality and makes us sin, ultimately. Because if we're not trusting, our, if we're not thinking soberly, and we're not trusting in God, we're going to ultimately go into the flesh. So how do we resist this gaslighting? Turn to Romans 12, verse 3. We're almost done. So, not to keep you too long. Uh, chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So God isn't saying think highly or think so lowly of yourself that you're going to trust some other man to guide you how you should go. But think soberly of how you should think about yourself. You're not the scum of the earth. You're not selfish to take care of the things of your family. You're not being selfish to think for yourself. Let's go to Galatians 5, verses 7 to 10, for our last uh, couple verses of this sermon. To resist gaslighting, don't accept the persuasion. Would you like to read the... Five. Yeah, Galatians 5, verses 7 and 10. And don't be afraid to speak up a little bit. You were, run, you were running well to hinder you back that you do not obey and see the truth. The persuadableness is not from him calling you. A little leaven 
leavens all the lump. I'm convinced or persuaded as to you in the Lord that you will exercise your mind, nothing else, but that the one stirring you shall bear the judgment, whoever he may be. So Paul's saying, whoever persuaded you, that's not from God. And he says as well in that, um, what was right after that? But I, brothers, if I proclaim circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then no, I mean before that. Oh, sorry. A little, a little leaven leavens, a whole leavens all yeah. the love. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pastors and uh, religious leaders who say, you know, I'm not really a false teacher, and you can swallow swallow the uh, meat, and and you can you can spit out the bones, you know, you know whatever I give you, just consume it. You don't really think about it too much. But Paul here is saying a little leaven leavens a whole lump, and he's talking about false doctrine here. So the whole idea of like, oh, you can listen to false teachers, just take the good stuff out and spit out the rest, or you know. If this person leads you to, or this person teaches false doctrine, and, oh, you'll be blessed if you follow it, regardless of whether it's, it's true. That's a lie. The, the idea here that Paul is saying is that a little leaven, a little false doctrine, you know, you don't eat the meat and spit out the bones. You should just rega- disregard it. Don't even be persuaded by it. And Paul goes on then to talk about his credentials and what, God has done in his life. So let me end it with this quote that I that came to me as I was uh, thinking about this sermon this week. You have agency. You don't need to give yourself permission to think. You already have it. You're not crazy. And there's people out there who will make you question yourself to the point where you have to ask yourself permission just to think. Just to think about something that is contrary to what they're saying. And from Paul's example, we need to be able to not, we need to give ourselves permission. Always give yourself permission. Trust in God, not in man. God expects us to be good stewards of ourselves. So use your agency rightly. That being said, God bless and amen. Hi guys, my name is Apostle Clark Abood and I want to thank you for watching our video. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're going to be setting up a Reddit page and a few other ways for you to get in touch with us. And we're also looking forward to be adding uh, more leaders into the church, bishops and apostles, as God calls them. And I just want to thank you. God bless. Amen.